the Cannabis Research Center mission, if you haven't known it till now, it, our center prom promotes interdisciplinary scholarship on the social and environmental dimensions of cannabis production. Through scientific research and engagement with community, government, and academic entities, we advance understanding of cannabis and socioecological systems at the local, national, and global scales. <clears throat> so what do we do? Uh, on our website, crc.berkeley.edu, we have over 40 publications, most of them peer-reviewed, several policy reports we, we published, a number of fact sheets and educational videos on various aspects of cannabis cultivation, the communities that cultivate them, um, and the environments in which they cultivate. We conduct research. We inform policymakers about that research, what we find. We partner with stakeholders to do that research and also to disseminate that research. And we also hold events like this to educate the public. Also, we now have um, gear shop up in case anybody's uh, curious about getting some Cannabis Research Center swag. Um, and we also are doing a crowdfunding campaign. So if you have anything to spare, uh, you can find us on socials. There's our Instagram, Berkeley CRC. And on X, we're at, um, at Berkeley CRC. Um, and you can also just go to our website where it's all posted on our news page. So today I'm going to be talking about unlicensed cultivation, as it said in the um, uh, program, but I'll also I'll be focusing in on work that I've been doing with Dr. Margiana peterson Rockney, who will be following me, and Dr. Christy Getz over here at ESPLM in, at UC Berkeley, uh, specifically on work we've been doing on cultivation bans in California. So the title is Governing Through Bans, question mark, Cultivation, Regulation, and Punitive Legacies. So cannabis bans in California are quite common. Only a third of the counties in the state actually allow cannabis cultivation um, to be to proceed. Yet nearly three quarters of localities in California actually voted for legalization, including two thirds of counties, right? Nationally, 13 of the 16 legalized states um, that have fully functional systems by now, they allow local level bans. And most localities and most of the states, um, uh, the majority of localities actually institute those bans um, for the majority of their, their localities. So if the US accounts for 85% of the legal global market, then local bans may be the most pervasive legalization policy, quite ironically, right? So we set out two years ago to understand the cannabis cultivation ban. We had two simple questions, which was what causes ban policies? And what effects do bans have? We had more kind of intricate questions uh, at a sub-level about do bans work? When, where, and why do they work? And what do they work at? When do they fail and why? And are there better and worse ways of governing through bans? And that's what I want to get at today. So to answer this, we did com a comparative study of four different counties uh, of Napa, Yuba, San Bernardino, and Siskiyou counties. Uh, we did interviews from the spring of 2022 until the fall of 2023 with over 100 people, probably closer to 150, including officials, cultivators, residents, and others. So what do cannabis bans do? <clears throat> Just adjust my screen a little. Okay. So first of all, on the surface of what they portend to do, Cannabis bans seek to expel or to banish an activity. They make the statement, not here, not in this community. They uh, also envision a world in which government policy can absolutely stop an activity. They, they are aiming for cessation, stopping, halting. There's an imaginary of a kind of strong government here, exercising total control over whether an activity will occur or not. There's shadows in this of prohibition logics of the ability kind of under the drug war to be able to stop um, drug activity simply by saying no. But distinct from prohibition, there's um, this is uh, cannabis is decriminalized in California, um, in fact, legalized. Um, so it now doesn't depend on criminal bans, but these are civil bans done under the capacity of local governments, namely their control over land use, where, when, and how something will happen, and with bans, whether or not they're allowed to happen at all. So that's the surface, but in actuality, bans are not quite the absence of regulation, they're regulation by enforcement and punishment. Unlike regulation though, they can only say what not to do, not what to do. In that way, it's a form of indirect regulation by force. For local populations, 
they adapt and they build informal norms. The best they can hope for, state and the government, is to influence behavior by causing adaptations and instituting informal norms, meaning they try to get people to control themselves through signals they make through enforcement and punishment. And a lot of times this can actually reproduce prohibition uh, dynamics on the surface level, just simply through the imposition of a big no from the government. But at worst, they actually can often reinstitute, reinstitute prohibitive dynamics like racialized policing, uh, which Margiana will talk about, exceptional punishment and social marginalization. So getting into the case studies, uh, I want to start with um, Napa County, which on the face of it is a ban that seemed to have worked. Between 2020 and 2023, there are virtually no documented um, outdoor unlicensed cultivation cases. Um, and this wasn't really because the county had some amazing totalizing enforcement system to detect and eradicate all cannabis, um, quite to the contrary. What we found through um, field work in Napa County um, in the absence of those kinds of um, law enforcement first approaches was that they really diffused a lot of the um, need for unlicensed cannabis cultivation simply by making personal cultivation accessible and allowable in the in the county. This increased access for a lot of people. Um, so people that wanted to have some plants didn't have to break the law. And there was a pathway to legal cultivation, a, a means of normalizing things. They also integrated cannabis into local land use policies and treated it really as a civil matter, whereas responded to by planning and zoning officials rather than law enforcement first. And it was really a neighbor to neighbor kind of issue. Um, and this really led to the normalization, I think, of cannabis in the county, even if not at commercial level, certainly at the personal level. So another factor that we found in Napa County was that it's quite expensive there. Land is quite expensive. Labor is quite expensive. An average property is almost uh, $1 million. Uh, it's expensive to grow cannabis on private land, therefore, and also labor is just hard to support because housing is scarce and the cost of living is quite high. And in addition, on public lands, a lot of it um, had been affected by recent fires in 2017 and 2020. Um, and also the penalties for growing on public land generally are higher. So people are, in what I've been noting across the state, people moving on to private land and out of public lands generally. So the seeming success story of, can, of, of cultivation bans um, didn't seem at the end to have a lot to do with bans at all. But in fact, cultivation stopped not because of bans, but other economic, ecological, and uh, policy factors. So in Yuba, we noticed a little bit of a different pattern of governance, um, where um, over the, since 2020, about since COVID began, um, they have let up on enforcement and begun to operate in a little bit of a different way. They're, they've um, instituted waiting periods before uh, they will find somebody or do um, a, an, an abatement, go and cut people's plants. They'll allow you time to kind of abate um, problems by yourself. Um, and they treat it at, like any other kind of restricted land use. If you're in violation, they give you a notice, you have kind of a civil time to be able to, um, to work it out. So in that sense, it was treated um, like other kinds of land uses. And what this cultivated among cult, uh, among people, cultivators, farmers, was that um, that they were able to establish a bit of, of more social norms around how to grow cannabis. Um, uh, you know, the, people reported to us informal modifications to their growing behavior based on interactions that they had with officials and also signals that they were kind of indirectly being sent through kind of um, enforcement actions. So people stayed under size limit, um, people avoided water diversions, people didn't grow near the property lines where their neighbors would get pissed at them. Um, and because those were the people that were consistently busted. Uh, so really we saw like an informal system of rules emerging between enforcement and growers themselves. <clears throat> In contrast, we did work in Siskiyou and San Bernardino. Um, and there's a lot of differences between these counties, but I think there's some striking similarities. One is um, that they had an infeasible personal cultivation ordinance, uh, meaning that essentially anyone who grew cannabis was bound to be breaking um, local rules uh, and they were subject to enforcement. Also, land was cheap, meaning that people were more likely um, to be able to make a living. They were seeking out these places in order to be able to grow, especially um, in current market conditions where uh, profit margins are quite uh, slim. So unlike Yuba in the last couple of years, Siskiyou and um, San Bernardino took a very punitive approach with very um, intensive sheriff-led campaigns that brought lots of legal consequences as well as major financial penalties for growers and landowners. 
And they employed marginalizing discourses in the process that painted all growers with a broad brush as lawbreakers and worse, sometimes even enemies with comparisons to Mogadishu and other places, which subsequently produced an us versus them dynamic within communities. Um, you know, these are very divided places. Um, cultivators are very vilified. So this resulted in San Bernardino in lots of adaptive cultivation techniques. People moved into more remote places. They um, tried to hide in new innovative ways. They were growing in intensive short cycles that often meant more extractive relationship to their environments. Um, and they persisted in cultivation despite enforcement, um, which I think suggests that there was really, and this is kind of the reports we heard from most cultivators, there was really an economic motive around why people continue to persist in cultivating um, that the cheap land might uh, suggest. Um, and also in San Bernardino in particular, the proximity to consumers uh, was important. And these were mostly people, farmers, that had few other formal market options. These were people that didn't couldn't leave the cannabis industry. And I think particularly in this period of 2022, 2023, at the bottom of kind of like price, uh, the price drop, um, folks who were left were really struggling, I think, to make a profit at all. And most people who could got out. Um, and that's consistent with um, a report we'll be putting out this month on another project I'm working on. In Siskiyou, cultivation subsided in less enforced areas because of falling prices in their remote geographies that made it really hard to access markets. But in more enforcement, enforced areas where enforcement was much more intense, specifically among ethnically Hmong people, cultivation in communities um, uh, adapted. Uh, people organized for their self-protection against police. Um, and they had to establish kind of a parallel system of governance um, to provide for themselves what the government wasn't able to do because of their um, vilification and sometimes uh, very direct criminalization of people living in those areas. So as far as recommendations, you know, can bans be done better, you know, because there's clearly some worse and some better um, uh, results here. And I think if we were to take any lessons from this, well, the first would be that there needs to be a feasible path to personal cultivation, if not a regulatory program altogether. Second would be that there needs to be tolerant approaches to cannabis as a land use, um, to really normalize cannabis and integrate it into existing land use systems. Um, third would be education and redirection. So when people are in violation to be able to educate them on what else to do, we commonly heard this from cultivators um, as something they wished was available to really have a pedagogical approach to regulation, uh, even to bans and to have reasonable financial consequences. Cause we can, you know, if people are motivated by economics, then we could say, we'll go after people with financial consequences, but, um, it might address that economic logic, but I think it would do behoove us to remember who is actually kind of left in the unlicensed cultivation system. And these aren't, you know, despite all the discussion of cartels and organized crime and whatever we might imagine that to be, most of these are um, marginalized, low-income, ethnically marked, racially marked peoples um, who are trying to figure out how to make a living. Um, so there's a lot of shortcomings to be spoken of, but I'll just focus on one with bans. Is it really, at the end of the day, the only kinds of regulation, if you're not going to be able to stop cannabis cultivation, is to be able to regulate it, but the best bans can do is to regulate it very indirectly. Um, this is really governance by signal um, for better and worse. So the question remains, what kinds of signals are we actually sending? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Two questions from the audience for you. Okay. Or do we want to wait until, because we had a question and answer at the end of the four? Yeah. Can we do that? Okay. Um, unless, yeah, no, let's do that. Okay. All right. Margiana? Do you need to drag it over again? Or? I don't, I don't want to mess it up. I want to present your video. For the next presentation. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, do you know where the next presentation is? It's in the... Did you speak on that? Uh, no. I can just uh, play. Yeah. 
<clears throat> um, great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, my name is Mariana peterson Rockney, and I'll be presenting today some of our research um, from the same project that Michael was just talking about with um, Dr. Michael Polson and Dr. Christy Getz. And um, all right, it's not advancing. Sorry. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start with a tiny bit of background. Um, so you already saw this map, but you know, since Proposition 215 back in 1996, local control has been a really key uh, part of the cannabis debate and policy development in California. Um, and Michael already explained that you know three quarters of counties and cities have banned cultivation entirely. Um, and so what that means is, although the majority of state voters in California voted to approve Proposition 64 and legalized cannabis, now a majority of residents live in the state um, in localities where there's no pathway to legal permitting um, and legally growing cannabis. So for this presentation, I'm going to share some work uh, from a paper that we're currently writing which is really focused on Siskiyou County, one of those four areas where we conducted case studies. And Siskiyou County is in the mid Klamath River Basin in Northern California, up on the Oregon border. And it's one of the largest, least populated, whitest and poorest counties in California. And prior to 2014, there was really no mention of cannabis in county records, despite talking to multiple uh, primarily white men who had grown medical marijuana in this medicinal county for decades without any issue. Then starting in the mid 2010s, suddenly the majority of the county's governing capacity shifted to cannabis through ordinances, zoning amendments, budget allocations. Um, they really started to focus on cannabis. And this sudden shift in resources and governing capacity to what the county called this out of control problem that threatens our way of life of cannabis cultivation really coincided with two things. One, of course, was legalization and the passage of Proposition 64. And the other was an in-migration to this region of Asian, and Asian American farmers, many of them Hmong in Sis into Siskiyou County. So starting in about 2014, Hmong farmers began purchasing small contiguous plots of land in several large rural subdivisions. And this is what those subdivisions look like. There are four in the county, each with over a thousand one to two acre plots that were previously mostly unoccupied. And these plots are dry with rocky slopes um, and they were cheap with few houses. Most of the estimated 6,000 residents, many of them Hmong, who live here still live in campers and temporary housing um, like plywood houses. And there are no public services like paved roads or electricity or water, making farmers on this land especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change like drought and wildfire. And many of those early in migrant Hmong farmers were elders like Mr. Mua pictured here. They're retirees who came to the U.S. as refugees and veterans of the U.S.'s secret war in Laos. Many had worked in factories in St. Paul um, or farms in Fresno and Arkansas. People described wanting to farm, to own land, and to live in community. The photos on the right here are of preparing food at a community feast when we were doing field work there last fall. But another set of visible potential water users, especially a group marked as racially and ethnically different, has been unwelcome by many longtime residents in the county. In addition to small livestock and crops like tomatoes and ginger, many Hmong farmers grow cannabis, which is locally banned. And farmers described growing cannabis as medicine to soothe injuries from the war and repetitive farm and factory work. Some people also sell this crop to support their retirement and maybe even send a little money home to their children or grandchildren to help them pay for college. And here, I wanna just emphasize that there are few crops that a farmer can turn any profit on on an acre or two of very marginal land. But at the same time that Hmong farmers moved to the area, the county mounted a new governing response to cannabis, 
The county government banned cultivation um, in 2016 through an emergency declaration and asserted that this crop is not agriculture. They are not real farmers. And <clears throat> Much of the county and, and media's rhetoric, both in terms of the you know, discourse public officials used and public comments and meetings, leveraged anti-Asian tropes and environmental concerns. Government officials emphasized water use, wildfire risk, and pesticide contamination in connection to cannabis to justify targeted enforcement efforts. Officials used local policy tools like zoning amendments, to destroy crops and created new fines and fees. The county also used new state groundwater regulations to sue farmers and fish and game code to arrest farmers. The county found that rapidly changing cannabis poli policy and climate change anxieties created opportunities for innovation in land and water use policy enforcement. One of the early land use changes was passed in November 2017, when the county banned camping, even on someone's own private property, which was partly justified by wildfire concerns and what many residents and county officials described as a tool to site people in the subdivisions, most of whom live in RVs or unpermitted plywood homes. And many had been waiting years to get building permits to build a permanent home. Um, oh. One Hmong resident who was not a farmer pointed out that white people can live off the grid and it's called sustainable. But when Asian people want to live off the grid, they are labeled as dirty criminals. They judge us all as marijuana growers. There's no surface water in the subdivision, in the subdivisions, and most of the groundwater is contaminated with arsenic. Nearly everyone in the subdivisions has to buy water in. Water trucks fill from deep agricultural wells owned by several local ranchers, and many people store their water in above ground swimming pools like these. And local leaders like the Board of Supervisors and Sheriff have successfully built this broad and unlikely political coalition that leverages climate anxieties, especially around drought and with urban environmental groups um, and agencies like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And county leaders then exercise their local discretion to innovate new water use code and enforcement strategies. In 2021, the county passed a series of water ordinances that banned moving water from one parcel to another, banned the use of groundwater to grow cannabis, and then banned transporting water on certain county roads. But what's really crazy is that they only banned the transport of water on the roads surrounding the subdivisions where primarily Hmong farmers lived. For the approximately 6,000 people living in these subdivisions, estimated 75% of the Hmong, they suddenly had no water. One Hmong farmer put it simply saying, without water, we can't live. This water was not just for growing cannabis, it was for everything, drinking, bathing, watering pets and livestock, and irrigating kitchen gardens. These photos are of an unpermitted house that was abandoned after the water ordinances went into effect. They really did drive people out of the area. And this is what a citation looks like. And um, here I want to point out a few things. One, if cannabis is present, code enforcement can elevate the fines and allow them to begin accruing immediately without giving cultivators an opportunity to fix the problem. Um, you know, and these are often problems that you might find on any farm, like an unpermitted shed or an electric cord. Also, the amount that people often owe is huge. And to reduce the fine, farmers have to return the land to its original condition and remove all evidence of human activity, which of course makes the land not hold any value. And although Asian Americans comprise just about 1.6% of the county's population, we um, analyzed citation data um, that we retrieved through a Public Record Act request um, in partnership with some collaborators. And we found that over 70% of the fines under these three water ordinances were against Asian Americans. And 88% of the property liens that the county placed for unpaid fines in 2021 were against Asian American property owners. <clears throat> 
And this is what that data looks like, um, where you know we've redacted identifying information. But I want to point this out to show that column F is how we calculated race based on um, census data likelihood that a particular last name is Asian or Pacific Islander. And it's also important to note the timing here of the county's action. Um, actions. In uh, 2021 was the year that localities were required to submit their plans for reducing groundwater extraction under California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And by focusing on estimates of water use for cannabis, then getting rid of the farmers growing cannabis, the county could meet state groundwater re reduction targets without having to curb the water used in the region to grow an increasingly large crop of export um, oriented alfalfa. And, uh, you know, which you can actually see being irrigated behind the water truck here. And while the sheriff estimates that cannabis was using about 2 million gallons of water a day in the county, alfalfa was using more than 400 million gallons of water a day in the county. And the use of water policy and climate and, and drought anxieties to target certain farmers did spark political protests, this one in front of the sheriff's building in 2021. And the ACLU and Asian Law Caucus filed a class action lawsuit against the county government for what many say is a pattern of racially biased rural water policy enforcement. And that case is still in litigation. But in the meantime, the farmers that we work with are struggling to survive and build a home here. As one older Hmong farmer told us, my entire life I was born into conflict, searching for a home to make permanent. It is so sad that I'm still driven out from my home. I'm always forced to flee with violence. So I'm going to conclude here and with a, a couple thoughts or takeaway thoughts. One is that bans create this uneven patchwork where farmers of the very same crop are treated like entrepreneurs in one locality and treated like criminals in another. Another is that rapidly changing cannabis policy and, and also rapidly changing climate policy are creating opportunities for innovation um, in both new policy development and enforcement strategies. A third <clears throat> is that while growing cannabis is no longer a felony in and of itself in California, civil regulation can also be extremely punitive and really life-changing for cultivators, especially when punishment approaches are leveraged immediately with high fines and fees and people aren't given the opportunity to learn or correct mistakes that they're making. And the final takeaway I want to emphasize is that racial disparity in enforcement persists, replicating well-documented disparities and inequities in the war on drugs. Thank you. Everybody laughs now. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Joanna Hossack, and I'm joined today by my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Amanda Ryman, Seth Avram La Rosa, and Dr. Margiana Peterson Rockney, uh, who'll be speaking in a moment. So we are very pleased to share our research on licensed and unlicensed cultivation across ban and permit counties in California. The PIs on this project are Van Butzik, 
and Dr. Michael Polson and Dr. Amanda Ryman. And then we're also uh, joined with Chris Dillis, who's joining online later today, um, and Dr. Jeremy Sorgan, who couldn't make it today. So our project goals, let's start with that. So the first objective is to estimate the total unlicensed cannabis cultivation amounts and their geography between 2018 and 2022. So the amount that's been cultivated in the state and also the specific locations of where that's occurring. The second objective is to identify local policies that are correlated with either the expansion or the contraction of the unlicensed market. And the third objective is to examine ultimately whether bans or permit ordinances are more effective at preventing unlicensed cultivation. So we have a mixed methods approach. We've got a lot of different special uh, experts on this team. We're all bringing something different to the table. Um, and we're looking at state water board data, looking at a first in kind um, mapping software called Canavision. We have a legal research component, which is looking at local policy and um, implementation of that policy. We're looking at metric data, consumer surveys, and retail point of sale data. And finally, there is uh, we have an ethnography component where we're going to have interviews, observations, and secondary material research. So one of the first steps in this project has been to analyze and catalog local policies. We're looking at ordinances in all 58 counties, so it is quite expansive. We're examining bans and permits. And then from that, we're gonna create variables to inform the mapping component of the project, which will be discussed next. So you've seen this map already from the DCC's website uh, showing that many, the most local jurisdictions ban cannabis activity and less regulate. And so in each of those, frameworks, we're going to be looking at different aspects of the ordinance. So in ban counties, we're looking at investigation approaches, whether it's law enforcement or code enforcement, if it's using satellite imagery, enforcement pr practices, um, mainly, you know, to what extent is law enforcement involved. Uh, pretty much every county that bans use a public nuisance abatement process. And then they also implement some type of fine or penalty. And that's where things get really different is that some counties, you know, have a $500 fine, some it's like 30 grand. So that obviously has a, a pretty big impact in uh, the, the penalties associated with unlicensed cultivation. We're looking at whether the enforcement is done by the sheriff or a special cannabis enforcement team. And then to what extent landlords or property owners are held responsible for unlicensed cultivation on their property. And then for permit counties, we're looking at all of those enforcement factors in addition to their structure for regulating. So what kind of permits do they have? Are they conditional use permits, ministerial business licenses? Are there permit, permit or acreage caps? Uh, what is the local cannabis tax structure? What is the CEQA process? Uh, if there are any zoning or setbacks or other limitations on the location where cannabis can be cultivated legally, and then you know comparing that ultimately with enforcement techniques against the unlicensed industry that is in a permit county. So the next kind of step in that process is to map unlicensed cultivation. So we're utilizing products from the California State Water Resources Control Board's machine learning platform called Canavision. So what this does is it takes satellite imagery and it pairs that with a machine learning process to identify locations where outdoor cultivation and mixed site cultivation occur on a map. And with this, we hope to be able to estimate the unlicensed cultivation amounts in California and where those occur, which counties. Um, and we're also going to be looking at terrain-based variables. So as you can see here, things like roads, streams, um, whether there's public land, forested land, slope, 
uh, and then taking also all the work that we're doing, the planning code summaries to create a list of variables that we can then put into this software, uh, into this map and see if there are any impacts from bans or from permitting ordinances that impact the expansion or contraction of cultivation in that county. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Amanda Ryman to talk about the next component of the project. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. So I'm going to talk about the triangulation of uh, our estimates of unlicensed production and then how that follows through the supply chain to the consumer. So this is not dissimilar to how we measure alcohol, right? We look at how much alcohol is being produced. We look at how much alcohol is being bought, and then we look at how much people say they are consuming. Now, spoiler alert, these things usually don't match up, especially when we talk about consumption. People are very bad at remembering how much they consume of something, um, but we're really trying to look at how these three measures match up. So on the one hand, we're looking at metric data to estimate the amount of cannabis produced in California in a given year, and this is in weight, right? Because we don't estimate the value of it at that point. It's really estimated in weight. And then we're looking at how much of that is going into a distributor's hands versus a manufacturer's hands, because we're really looking at flour here as the end product. It's very hard to estimate how much is going into an edible, how much is going into make distillate or isolate. So we're really looking at is whole flour that's either being sold in jars or uninfused pre-rolls. Then we're looking at a utility company energy data to estimate indoor production. And Seth's gonna be talking about that in a minute, but we had to figure out a way to look at not only licensed energy production, uh, which we know where the licensed cultivators are, but how do we identify unlicensed indoor cultivators? And one of the ways you do that is by looking at their energy use patterns. Um, I don't want to step on Seth's toes, but you know, there's a very particular energy use pattern that comes with indoor cultivation. It's usually 24 hours of light on, followed by a 12-12 cycle. So identifying buildings that fit this um, and, and trying to understand if they're cannabis cultivation. And then finally, using a point of sale and consumer data to estimate the amount consumed and purchased in California. So this is work that I'm doing in my role of, as New Frontier Data. Uh, so we're analyzing point of sale data for dispensaries in California to determine the weight of flour bought through licensed dispensaries in the state of California for a given year. New Frontier Data also conducts a consumer survey. It's a national survey of over 4,000 consumers. It covers all 50 states, and the sample is matched to each state's uh, census in terms of age, ethnicity, and gender. So we're able to look at people's consumption habits. We ask them, how much do you con how much flour do you consume in a given week? Again, take that number with a grain of salt. Um, but we're able to take that data and then blow it out to the entire state of California to estimate how much people in California say they're consuming in a given week. And then from that, we can get annual data. Now we're asking people that both use and don't use dispensaries. So we're able to look at both folks who say my primary source is licensed retail and people who say my primary source is a dealer or friends and family and look at differences in consumption amounts in those two different groups. We're then going to combine that together and see how much cannabis can we account for. So um, many, many years ago, I did a, a postdoc at the alcohol research group here uh, on campus. And even with all of the nuances and how they asked people about their consumption, they were only ever really able to account for about 53% of the alcohol sold in the United States through what people say they actually consume. Uh, you know, when we talk about beer, it's a bit easier because it's 12 ounces. But when you talk about wine and liquor, people don't know how much they're putting in their drink. They do not know how big their glass of wine is. So even though somebody might be buying an eighth of cannabis, it's very difficult for them to know how much they're consuming at a given time because everybody's bowl is different. The size of joints that people roll are different. So we really go by how much they're purchasing and that helps them understand, I go through an eighth a week, I go through an ounce a month, and that really helps us with those consumption totals. All right, Seth, you're up. Hi everyone. My name is Seth LaRosa. I'm a graduate student researcher with the Cannabis Research Center, and I'm in the Land Use Change Lab. 
Uh, this portion of the project came about in thinking about how to estimate illicit or unpermitted indoor production. This is a puzzle that people have been trying to solve for a long time in the state of California. Um, the idea, and we haven't, it hasn't borne out all the way yet, but we're in the process of requesting the data right now from PG&E and we, and we have a green light from them for this portion of the project. So the idea is to get some user data from PG&E for the permitted sites that we know are engaged in industrial scale cannabis production. And then using a machine learning model, try to determine the energy signature. As Amanda was pointing out, there's a very distinct signature from indoor production, just from, you know, for agricultural necessity of, uh, of growing anything basically under lights, right? You have a time period where you're gonna have full 24 hour light, then there'll be a period of darkness. And in many instances, you'll see a distinct 1212 signature for the flowering period. So the idea is if we can match this energy signature with machine learning to get a sense of what that signature looks like for, for licensed production, we could then go and run that model over a larger data set um, to try to establish unlicensed production in areas. This could be really interesting, not just for this project going back to 2018, but going all the way you know, for future projects or future ideas with this data or with this model, um, looking at for instance, like Measure Z in Oakland, which was, I think, 2004, um, where you saw like a lot of indoor production happening really quickly in Oakland um, when the city voted to make cannabis enforcement its lowest priority. So if we could get this model working, we could go back and look at areas spatially that we know there was an increase in production temporally in a certain time period um, to sort of test the model to see how robust it is and to see what kind of changes have occurred, not just since 2018, but conceivably going as far back as the as the data would allow. Um, again, we're working with PG&E right now. And the idea is if we can get this model running, uh, we'll petition SoCal Edison that does most of the power and electrical use for the Southern half of the state, as well as like smaller municipal providers like Ukiah and some small municipalities have their own energy um, production places. So that's the general idea. And um, yeah, I, I'm hoping it works. I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> And I think next up, we're going to talk about interviews. I'd like to invite Dr. Rocky Peterson back up. Um, yeah, thank you. So, um, so another step of this project is to sort of ground truth and understand what's actually happening in communities on the ground. So what we'll do is select um, a number of case studies of about eight counties for permit for ban based on some of this quantitative and mapping data. And then we will conduct interviews um, with people on the ground, including cultivators and local policymakers, and then we'll code that data um, with a special eye towards the impact of sort of policy interventions. Um, and then we'll be able to pair that qualitative data with the statistical modeling and the, the spatial data that we have to really try to understand in a very interdisciplinary and multi-methods way, the effect of policy interventions and spatial variables on the patterns of both unlicensed and permit um, production. And then finally, um, some next steps. Uh, right now, we're at the this, this stage of getting ready to select those eight counties, those four band, four permit counties to do this ethnographic research, which we will do starting later this summer, um, which will also include some archival analysis, depending on what those counties are, looking at you know policy documents, et cetera. And then we'll analyze factors that influence um, unpermitted cultivation, and then estimate the total unlicensed production, um, you know, where cultivation occurs and the policies that influence unlicensed production. And we can, um, are we taking questions now or is there another presentation? One more presentation. Okay, so hold your questions and we will take those after the next presentation. Take a break at five. Should we do a five minute break? Can you have a second? Oh, it's, it's down. Do you have 300 minutes? I don't. It's just going to be one minute. Thank you. Well, well.
Yeah, you can just go. And then uh, go. Forward. And then the and then collaborative peer oh, support. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Seth LaRosa again, I'm back. Um, I wanted to tell you about some research that we did uh, from 2021 to 2023 that was funded by the DCC and was conducted by the Cannabis Research Center. Um, basically, when um, Prop 64 went into effect, I think most of us are aware of the history around this, it was sort of a, a rushed effort on the part of the counties uh, to consult with stakeholders. Uh, in many instances, tribes were not consulted, and there was kind of an unreported um, kind of clamoring amongst tribes that that there was no academic research done on effects cannabis effects from cannabis policy changes to to tribal communities and to Native American groups. Um, so over these two years, we conducted research with all of the federally recognized tribes in the state. We didn't actually uh, hear from everyone, but did major outreach. Uh, to the 120 federally recognized tribes, as well as around 40 state recognized tribes, um, and built a couple of Qualtrics surveys and did a lot of interview work, basically to determine what kind of impacts uh, tribes were seeing due to cannabis policy changes. Uh, this graph is kind of an amalgam of a lot of different questions that we asked around um, impacts or concerns around impacts. And basically what it's showing here is you see a roughly the same amount of people with no concern as with a lot of concern uh, at the top there. But if you really kind of roll in everyone that had some level of concern, you see that about 78% of our respondents were, were concerned in some capacity with how cannabis policy was, was rolling out. Um, so I, I told Michael I'd be quick with this, so I will. But basically through this project, we've done a few publications, um, Environmental Letters E and the Journal of Extension talking to to policy folks about how they could better serve tribes through outreach and, um, and through cooperative approaches as opposed to sort of like a top-down method that you often see in, in planning departments. Um, and through that, through these interviews and conversations, one of our products in addition to publications is this tribal resource page. Let's see if this works. No. Um, can we full screen? Thank you. And this was basically done to facilitate tribal groups um, getting access to information that was again and again reported to us was difficult to attain. Um, so as opposed to each individual tribe, again, 120 federally recognized tribes in the state having to do their own due diligence to find these resources, the Cannabis Research Center put this page together. Um, basically, it's divided around policy and land use, mapping and GIS tools, and tribal consultation. And it's basically, just as it says, it's a resource for tribes that can access um, you know, different information, different links to different sites. And importantly, uh, we have a link to the mapping product that we've worked on uh, at the Cannabis Research Center, which shows the permitted cannabis uh, properties across the state spatially. And this enables tribes basically to download this GIS layer, um, put their own shape file for their own tribal boundary around it, and to determine how much cannabis is, is being grown or permitted in their tribal jurisdiction. Um, and so, yeah, we are still, the project wrapped up in 23. We have a, uh, an extension going, so I think we still have a couple publications that, that are still forthcoming. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share this tribal resource page and a little bit about the research that's already been done. So thanks very much. So we do have a, a break scheduled, but maybe we skip it and invite people to take care of themselves if they need to. And um, were there some questions online and also anybody in the audience, if there are questions for any of the speakers who've gone? Um, not in particular. Oh, sure. Um, the question was, do ban counties benefit from legal cannabis is that correct right in terms of tax revenue no um in uh, at the county level of course there's no county taxes levied levied and even at the state level um one of the very few carrots that exist for um 
uh, ban counties to consider going to, to be a permit county is that they would get access to enforcement support. Um, and so that's one of the very few carrots to kind of like lure counties into um, into cultivation policies. But otherwise, no, I don't I don't believe there are many benefits. OK. Um, let's see. Yes. So. OK, so. Um, does the state government treat cannabis as agricultural products? The answer is yes. Um, and there's a distinction between products and crops uh, that is quite legalistic, but at the end of the day, entirely different um, rules get applied to products um, up to commercial standards that don't get applied to crops, which have kind of their own special regulatory apparatus. Um, yeah, okay. Um, strategies to bring the illegal market to the legal market. Yeah, I'd have to think about that one. Um, and we're actually writing, we'll be putting out a report at the end of this month on unlicensed cultivation. And uh, yeah, there are 31 findings. So I'm sure in there you might find some some strategies to address that. Um, let's see, this just came in from Hannah. For a little while, local jurisdictions were enticed by exemption to CEQA for passing discretionary permitting systems. Mm hmm Helpful. Thanks. Okay. Any yes? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought uh, that the state plant allowance was state law, was Prop 64 required, right? So I guess I was curious about two things. One, um, I could you talk a little bit more about how like um, the counties made personal cultivation. Like regulatory or feasible yeah. their ordinances. And then second, does that create a possible path for the state to sue the counties that are effectively making it illegal or impossible to do? Right, right. Should I repeat that too? Or did it? Okay. So um the question was about the six plant allowance, personal allowance, and um and how it is that counties are able to go about that. And then does that give count uh, the state potential grounds for action against counties. Is that right? So um, so Prop 64, there's a right to grow or an ability, capacity to grow that's guaranteed in Prop 64 to grow six plants indoor. Um, and the counties are given um, uh, kind of leeway to regulate that indoor cultivation however they might want to. So what a lot of counties that don't want to see any cultivation occur um, have done is to implement permitting schemes, um, you know, um, yeah, in inspection kind of processes, all kinds of layers to actually be able to do those six plants indoors. And a lot of them have just taken the ability, which is granted in Prop 64, to fully ban outdoor um, cultivation altogether, even the six plants. So um, whether or not that gives, I think one of the things that we're recommending in our um, policy paper that, you know, we'll be publishing later, I think next month on the ban project, um, will be about, um, uh, do you remember this? Do you want to come up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, one of the things that we are suggesting is that the DCC create a commission that evaluates this because we have seen that there are basically these de facto bans on personal cultivation. And, you know, some of the people who we talk to and looking through what is required even to grow your six plants indoors, some people estimated, well, it would cost $40,000 to make this indoor space compliant with the local regulations and nobody, you know, can afford that for their six plants. Um, and so we are suggesting that the the state does take action to evaluate at the local level these kind of de facto bans of personal cultivation. Because we have talked to a lot of people who, you know, in the Napa case that Michael shared illustrates this, who um, who want to be able to grow for themselves, uh, which should, you know, is allowed technically in the law, but that's not actually possible. Any other questions? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, the question, the way you get the enforcement, does that come from local ordinances or do you have to include elsewhere? 
Yes. So um, <laughs> enforcement data is very hard to get, um, and there's no centralized way to get it. So that data was actually gotten through a Public Record Act request that the ACLU and the Asian Law Caucus filed and, you know, used their, like, legal clout to push the county to release that data. Um, and, and you know, it is technically publicly available. It's just not made publicly available in a way that's easy for people to find. Um, and so that's the data that that we were able to analyze. Um, but it is very difficult to do, and you have to, you know, you have to do that with each jurisdiction. So it'd be great to look at this, for example, across the state, but you would have to submit a public record act request to each city and each county um, to actually get that policing data, basically. Yeah. Sorry, just as long as I was there. Um, speaking of state level data, well, not state level, but statewide, um, have you thought at all at looking at city level data? And I would guess the production is very much in the counties and not the cities, but have you, if you have thought about it or looked at it, um, do you see any interaction between what counties decide and what cities decide and how they might influence each other? Absolutely. Um, yeah, there are two, two points that I want to make. Um, one is that we find we found that especially in these counties that are banned counties and then they have cities that are permit cities there's this kind of um capturing you know of of the market you know and a great example of this is in san bernardino the city of adelanto there has gone kind of all in on industrial scale you know permitted cannabis production and I've never seen anything like that. I mean, you'd go out into the desert and it's just like warehouse after warehouse, like as far as you can see, all growing cannabis indoors. Um, and so we are certainly seeing these dynamics. And in some sense, we actually do see that a lot of the, for example, bills that are before the assembly right now at the state um, that are proposing harsher penalties or refelonization, et cetera, are actually supported by the cannabis industry, the permanent cannabis industry, because of course, you know, that they, they have an interest in in stopping competition through the black and gray markets. Um, and so we do see this, this very strong relationship. Um, and I think there's definitely more research that could be done between these sort of permit cities and these banned counties. And then the last thing that I'll say here is there's also a lot of opportunity for um exploitation and um and there are a lot of cases in these cities especially in banned counties where there have been you know bribery and other you know it just creates this environment where there are opportunities to take advantage um and you can see that a lot of that has happened in places like Atalanto and San Bernardino City Okay, so I'll be talking about cannabis equity and uh, the preliminary interviews that I've been conducting with program managers across the state. So the objective of these preliminary investigations is to eventually apply for a DCC research grant to find out what equity program elements are actually increasing the number of licensed equity verified businesses. Uh, so we hope to surface be best practices, trends, and business models, and also show some innovative and effective ways to provide technical support. And uh, bottom line being, let's try to streamline these programs so they can have consistent financial support and continue with their momentum. So the quantitative piece of this will be conducted by this faculty and student collaboration at the Cannabis Studies Program at Cal Poly Humboldt. Uh, they have developed the Cannabis Studies Lab, which has produced several equity data, vis uh, data visualizations so far, uh, pulling information from the DCC's Cannabis Unified License Search Tool, 
And so they'll be covering that. The students have already done a lot of work in this area. And what I'll be doing is uh, gathering quantitative data through the local interviews. And so it was uh, this information, this data is readily available. I was able to get all the local jurisdictions that have received cannabis equity grants listed. Um, and then I went a little bit further to identify the programs and the people who manage these programs. And I've conducted three interviews so far with two more scheduled. And what I hope to get from these is direct insight from the program managers so we can see what's missing from the digital online data and websites. And we can dive into this um, uh, spreadsheet a little bit. Let me see. Uh, well, I'll, we just can look at it uh, visually. So what I did was I also created um, a column for the geographical locations of these programs, and I divided them into Northern area, Bay Area, Central Area, and SoCal. And so if we do kind of like a, a quick summary of all of the monies that have been uh, allocated to these different parts of the state, um, it's all about like 20 million at the lowest uh, in SoCal, $17 million that has gone to these different regions with uh, the Bay Area receiving the most amount of money. And then uh, let's see, I think it was Central second and then NorCal third and uh, SoCal fourth. Oops. I can't click forward anymore. Okay, thanks. So here's my primary data source so far. Five years of grants to counties and cities um, and the disbursements from the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. And every time that an allocation is uh, comes down from the legislature, the jurisdiction supply for the money and the GoBiz sends them the money, they post a, uh, a press release where we've gathered this financial data. Um, let me, can't really see. So some interesting findings. Uh, from looking at these two different kinds of equity grants is that there have been 20 equity assessment grants awarded amongst all these jurisdictions and 21 equity program grants. So that means 20 equity assessment grants to review the jurisdictions, their communities, and the landscape of participants, and then 21 equity program grants um, to actually direct money and services to people who verify, who are verified equity program participants. Um, and so, Amongst the equity assessment grants, only 11 of the 20 moved forward with actual programs. So nine jurisdictions, perhaps wisely, did not move forward with the program. And um, also notable is that some jurisdictions like Oakland and San Diego did their own internal equity assessments before um, I think the grants were available. So, uh, so they moved straight into their own internal assessment and then into an active program. And amongst the active programs, uh, since 2019, we've seen 21 jurisdictions receive funds to direct grants and services to program participants. Um, there's currently about 13 that are actively serving constituents. And in 2024, only 10 received funding. Uh, now, the jurisdictions that have received funding all five years are Humboldt, San Francisco, Oakland, and Sacramento. Now, a few jurisdictions, unfortunately, have suspended their services um, for various reasons. Some spent their money and didn't apply for a grant the following year. Some have not fully spent down their previous year's funds. Um, and there are some barriers due to local policy complications, uh, local regulation, crossroads, staffing issues, et cetera. So some more findings, interesting findings, are that local programs really have to design uh, what they present to their constituents based on regional demographics and culture. Uh, so in this design and administration of the programs, uh, some jurisdictions like Humboldt and Sacramento already had internal programs and staff uh, ready to execute. Hi. And uh, some jurisdictions explored third-party contractors, some of which were nonprofit contractors or for-profit contractors. And um, some uh, jurisdictions relied on like 
special contractors to provide education services. Uh, for example, Long Beach has real estate brokers who advise their participants on how to uh, identify a space, but they don't do the actual brokering. brokering. Uh, let's see, also, um, there's a challenge in actually facilitating the funding directly to the equity participants. So once a jurisdiction gets the money from GoBiz, then they have to find out how to put it into the hands of the equity verified participants. Um, it seems that most uh, programs you do this by absorbing the grantees as vendors in their supplier, their online supplier portal systems. Uh, the city of LA uniquely, I think, is the only one that was able to offer direct deposit of grant funds to their participants. Now, getting a check from a city of LA, city of Oakland, into the hands of somebody who has a bank account that isn't um, obviously like tied to their cannabis business can be tricky. So um, I had a client in Oakland who was using a um, a credit union for her banking and she had a 30K check from the city of Oakland and the bank, the credit union, wouldn't let her deposit it into her account. Um, they said, where did you get this money? Why is the city giving you this money? And she was saying, oh, it was like an award. You know, my, my business is, you know, getting support from the city and they really pressed her on what it was for. So direct deposit is a blessing um, for these participants who don't need another hurdle to jump through when trying to receive these funds. Um, and so a clever way to get around this is um, for the jurisdictions to provide services or like fee waivers and do an interagency transfer. So instead of the money coming from GoBiz directly to the hands of the participants, it um, stays kind of behind the scenes uh, in where maybe the city administrator's office would transfer funds to their city planning office to cover a fee or some sort of other administrative cost. Ah, and so there are funding caveats. When the money comes from GOBIS to the jurisdictions and they're trying to get it to the program participants, um, there's a disguised financial burden and a 30% tax on these grants. So somebody who's getting, you know, 50K isn't really getting 50K. At the end of the year, they have to pay that 30% tax rate. Um, and if a equity program participant has uh, restrictions on their income level because they're receiving some sort of benefits, disability benefits, or other subsidies, getting this grant could really mess up their taxes. Yeah. Uh, also, the eligible use of funds for equity programs are also restricted. So if somebody paid their rent from their savings six months in advance and then got a 50K check from, from an equity program, they can't reimburse themselves. They can only spend those monies on future purchases. So they could pay it for the next, next six months of their rent or for uh, construction that's gonna happen in a month, but they can't reimburse themselves. Uh, these are only for future expenses and expenses related to their cannabis business. So they can't pay their own rent. They can't um, you know, pay anything personal. They have to use all of the funds for their, for their business. And um, so some of the challenges are that most of these businesses are in the startup stage and they won't be making revenue anytime soon. So uh, they are putting money into something that's not giving them a return on their investment. Um, and also some jurisdictions, if they're past the startup stage, they allow grantees to purchase um, uh, inventory cannabis products with this these funds, uh, but not every jurisdiction allows that because not every jurisdiction has equity program participants that are out of the startup phase and actually licensed and running their businesses. Um, and another solution that some jurisdictions have uh, introduced to their program is to create a source of internal or local funding so they're not dependent on GoBiz funds. Um, an example of this is in Long Beach where they charge their general operators an annual fee that feeds back into their equity program. So in addition to these interviews and the data uh, visualizations that will be coming from the student and faculty at Cal Poly Humboldt, um, over my five years uh, as a technical assistance provider and underwriter for these programs, I've mapped some of these systems. So I've mapped what it looks like when the city staff is charged with executing these programs, not just the equity programs, but all of their cannabis permitting uh, processes. Um, there's also a flow of state funding for the equity programs from 
uh, the state to GoBiz, to the programs, to the participants. And uh, a really complex systems map that I made was to see what happens when the grant or, un or loan underwriting process begins. So most people who are in equity programs don't really have an idea of how to create a, fo a financial profile for themselves. So there's a lot of handholding that goes through sort of onboarding them and helping them understand how they can use this money. Because it's not just, you know, money in hand. They don't just get a check and they get to do whatever they want with it. Uh, they have to go through this rigorous process of submitting uh, their personal information. Uh, they have to prove that they can be equity verified, which means uh, they were somehow affected by uh, prohibition in the war on drugs. That could be based on uh, what zip code they live in, what school district they went to, um, if they had like a criminal misdemeanor. And then they also have to provide often a lot of um, information about their business. So that could be a business plan. That could be um, them already paying business taxes in their city. Uh, sometimes they need insurance, even in the startup stage. So putting together all of that sort of baseline paperwork, um, which we call underwriting, in order to receive these state grants um, is creates a lot more uh, uh, hurdles for participants to jump through. So uh, yeah, that's the end of the presentation here. And uh, we'll ask questions. Looks like, um, oh, Margiana, Chris, and Michael will go next. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Laura, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, there's Chris. Hi. Can Chris share screen directly? I believe so. Well, we have uh, slides for, for this next presentation. Mm hmm All right. Um, but, uh, it's just this one. Is someone from the team moving to advance the slides, please? Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Do you want to step up so you can have And you can all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and I can advance the slides. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so let me just rearrange things real quickly. Okay, um, so thank you for allowing me to present. Um, what I would like to share with you today is a summary of a project that Michael, Mariana and myself uh, recently completed combining our various skill sets uh, on a topic of common interest, which is um, Geosocial, marginali ugh, geosocial marginalization in California's licensed cannabis industry. So given the prior focus today, I'd just like to repeat that, that this project was entirely focused on the licensed cannabis industry um, in California. Uh, and I uh, can go to the next slide. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, gotcha. Um, so just a little, some background and some motivations for this project. So cannabis is um, uh, probably the most heavily regulated agricultural crop in California in terms of its environmental impact uh, for several reasons, which I won't necessarily get into right here. But um, it's also um, one of the most uh, geographically restricted uh, agricultural crops in the state uh, based on uh, this option that counties and municipalities have to ban licensed cannabis cultivation, which um, we, we spoke about earlier today. Um, and 
so our work uh, for, for this project is exploring some of the social, political, and economic factors sort of shaping the spatial distribution of licensed cannabis uh, and the sort of resulting interaction between the geography of licensed cannabis uh, and, and the environment. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, and so, since this geosocial marginalization is going to be a term that uh, we'll be using repeatedly in this presentation, um, I thought I would uh, start by defining what we're, what we're talking about here. And, and so, by this, we're referring to how margins you know, of lands and societies are comprised through uh, and interwoven through by physical land use and social processes. Um, and the case of uh, cannabis marginalization through legalization sort of illuminates three dynamics of um, geosocial marginalization here. And so the first being biophysical marginalization uh, in which uses and users are directed toward non-prime lands with sort of sensitive ecologies, inferior soils, geology, slopes, access to water, etc. The second being uh, socioeconomic marginalization. Uh, or the ways that users are relegated to lands that can only really assume economically or socially marginal purposes. And then the third being um, sociopolitical marginalization uh, or the social and political subordination of certain uses and users to others, you know, such as growing cannabis versus other agricultural uh, products. Um, and we'd like to also note that, you know, instead of discrete categorizations uh, of, of, these, of these definitions, uh, these, these dynamics are sort of non-exclusive and sort of often overlap and articulate with one another. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, so we laid out these three research questions. Um, the first one being, you know, what are the factors that contribute to the geographic distribution of licensed cannabis farming in California? Um, the second one being, you know, how does cannabis compare with other forms of agriculture uh, based on these metrics of potential environmental impact? So we've heard you know, all sorts of things about the, the environmental impacts of um, unlicensed farming and that narrative sort of bleeds over into licensed cannabis production as well. So um, taking a look at that as well. And then finally, um, how do these social and political economic factors uh, play out? How do they how do they contribute to the geographic distribution um, and you know, the land features of, of licensed cannabis agriculture? Uh, thank you. And so our approach here uh, was a, a mix of quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, the quantitative analyses we, we were using to sort of try to identify these broad statewide patterns uh, using spatial data and then sort of apply some qualitative analyses, uh, you know, interviews uh, um, and whatnot uh, to uh, explore the sort of underlying mechanisms, uh, you know, sort of going to the, to the people who are actually on the, um, on the ground uh, participating in this uh, to, you know, to get answers to sort of explain some of the broad statewide patterns we're seeing. And so this uh, <laughs> is a, a figure or a map that is quite popular tonight, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, but I, I put this here just to illustrate that, you know, California is a patchwork of uh, county and municipal bands. And there's, you know, there's a lot of exceptions. So this zoomed in picture here on the right is sort of a demo, well, uh, 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 a figure showing that within these counties, there are municipalities that will um, allow cultivation. And so when we're trying to model this, um, we weren't really, we, we chose instead to, to focus at the county level and use the number of DCC cannabis licenses in a county across all of California's 58 counties, uh, the number of licenses in a county as a measure of the um, the the amount of licensed cannabis farming um, and the um, uh, in the county and so we considered several variables here um, these six here I, I have kind of categorized the first two being um, whether or not the county has a, a cultivation ban in the unincorporated areas um, you know because there still can be exceptions um, and then also whether or not the cannabis had an existing regulatory program prior to the 2018 launch of statewide licensing. Um, so this is, you know, the, this, the water board and I think CDFW maybe, but I know the water board and certain counties had um, uh, cannabis regulatory programs that uh, were in place as early as like 2015. Um, and then so the second set of variables here um, are, the, the purple ones here on the screen. Um, so we're sort of intended to reflect these, uh, the socioeconomic picture of each county. Um, 
whereas the third pair of variables here in green are intended to capture uh, socio-political factors. And so we have um, median income and proportion of retirement age um, as sort of uh, socio-economic um, factors. Um, the retirement age we set at 65. Um, so the proportion of the county's uh, population that's over 60 or 65 or older. Um, and then the other two, the proportion conservative was just the proportion of registered voters that um, identified as Republican. And proportion of farm employment is, you know, of all the jobs in the county, how many of them are on farm jobs. And so this is sort of like a proxy for the, um, the presence of um, what, you know, what we're going to produce traditional agriculture uh, in each county. Next slide, please. And so the second part of the quantitative analysis um, was to look at these uh, what we call potential environmental impact metrics. <clears throat> and then, you know, sort of ask like how the spatial distribution of cannabis, uh, you know, relative to other crops, um, you know, what, what the comparison looks like. Uh, so we compared cannabis to um, well, three other crop categories. One is just general all, all crops, I should, I should start by saying pasture, uh, vineyards, or all other crops besides cannabis, pasture, and vineyards. Um, and we, we, we decided to isolate pasture and vineyards because the other two, um, they're kind of often regarded as more uh, remote forms of agriculture, or I should say um, operating in remote areas. Um, and so these three environmental impact metrics we chose were um, average terrain slope. So this is something that's associated with potential for erosion and, and runoff, you know, both for the cultivation site itself and then also you know, any sort of infrastructure that's needed to access the site, uh, roads <laughs> specifically. Um, and then presence of water course, um, because, you know, if you have a water course on site, this is allowing direct access to service flows, you know, and increasing potential for impacts to water quality and, you know, water quantity too, for that matter. Um, and then finally, um, the presence of an underlying groundwater basin. And I, I should know if I hadn't said this already. Um, so we, we modeled this for locations of something like 2,500 cannabis farms, uh, uh, hay farms or, or pasture, uh, vineyards, and then these other crops. So these are models based on the locations of individual farms. Uh, okay, that being said, the third factor was um, whether or not these farms uh, had an underlying groundwater basin, um, and, and that being a, a positive thing because it um, ensures reliable access to irrigation water without needing to rely on uh, surface water or surface water storage um, you know, during some of the driest periods of the year when stream flow is most vulnerable. <laughs> excuse me, vulnerable. Um, okay, next page or slide, please. Um, and so just real briefly, uh, the, the analysis of the, the county to county basis and the predictors of the number of cannabis cultivation licenses, uh, there were two that were uh, statistically reliable. The first one being on-farm employment. Uh, so counties in which there was a larger proportion of jobs on-farm uh, tended to issue fewer cannabis licenses. Um, and the second one being uh, median income and uh, counties with higher median incomes also uh, issued fewer uh, cannabis licenses. Uh, thank you. And then as far as like these environmental impact metrics, when we compared cannabis to these other crop types, um, there was there was a pretty distinct difference um, in average slope. First of all, as you can see here, um, just the raw data, uh, cannabis farms, the, the, the average average slope uh, of cannabis farms was something around 13%, whereas other, other farm types, it's you know, below 2%. Um, these grayed out numbers you see here are the result of um, the model estimates from the models themselves, uh, which we actually like accounted for spatial autocorrelation. But for the purposes here, just to, to, to describe the results, um, we can just look at the black numbers. Um, the, the percentage of farms of each type that had a water course on site I mean, cannabis is well over um, well over half, and nobody else even uh, approached a quarter of the farms having a water course on site. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, the the number of cannabis farms that are actually in a groundwater basin are uh, substantially smaller uh, than than any other type of agriculture. Um, so I believe that's the the end of the quantitative results. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it over to you, Mariana, um, to uh, 
fold the two together. <clears throat> Great. So I'm really quickly going to mention three um, of the qualitative results, which we found were especially important in influencing where cannabis cultivation occurs. So the first one is competing agricultural land uses. Um, you know, a lot of the prime agricultural land in California is already taken. It's already being used to farm. Um, and farmers who grow other crops and raise livestock have access to a lot of federal and state programs to help them do that. Technical assistance, funding programs through the USDA to help buy land, to um, have crop insurance, et cetera. And then another big issue is that some agricultural uses are really in direct conflict with cannabis. For example, vineyards, which we looked at, um, use a lot of pesticides. And so that pesticide can drift onto cannabis and make cannabis farmers' crops, uh, you know, test too high for those pesticides and not be able to be sold. Another big um, concern over, you know, is over natural resources and environmental effects. And here, an important piece of our qualitative work was understanding the historical context here. It's, it's not an accident that cannabis has primarily been um, cited in these remote areas, far from governing centers, far from enforcement. And that means often on steep slopes, on places that had access to um, surface water. But what that means today is that cultivators often face this heavy burden of compliance and a lot of environmental controversies because of where they have historically been cited. Um, <clears throat> and then the third factor that we found was really important was the presence of anti-cannabis um, sort of political movements, especially often older, retired, and politically conservative voters, especially natural amenity consumers. So these are folks who buy land often in rural areas for the aesthetic value, for the ability to be in nature and engage in activities like fishing and hiking. Um, who tend to find cannabis to be aesthetically objectionable and unwelcome and not really fitting into a, a rural imaginary of a rural life that excludes drugs and the threats of urban racial taint that they carry. And so here to conclude, I'm, um, I know we're short on time, so I'm just going to say that the regulation of cannabis to these kind of marginal lands under prohibition and legalization is not an ahistoric accident. So I'm really going to emphasize that point. Rather, the uses and users of cannabis-related marginal lands are products of these social processes that create particular geographies that incite particular kinds of conflicts and generate new processes of marginalization. So this is that dynamic of pushing cultivators onto marginal land where it's harder for them to comply with environmental standards. And so we see this kind of cycle of marginalization. And these marginalities are primarily the product of historical and ongoing policy regimes, not the environmental or social deviance of individual actors um, or individual farmers, which they often are framed as in public debates. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and I'm not sure who's next, but thank you all for listening. Do you have notes? Uh, no. So my pointer is over here, but not on the screen. You can just arrow. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Phil Georgikakos, and I'll talk to you today about a project that is underway to quantify the potential for stream flow depletion from cannabis agriculture uh, in California's North Coast streams using storage dis discharge sensitivity functions. And this work uh, is done by myself, Chris Dillis, who you just heard from, Ted Grantham in the CRC, and then also David Drolly, Jesse Hom, and Dana Lapides. <clears throat> 
So we were really motivated by some foundational work by Scott Bauer and Jen Kara in 2015 that suggested that diversions for cannabis agriculture might seriously impact these coastal streams that in particular support populations of salmon. Um, and this motivated our question is, how does water extraction cultivation influence headwater stream flow? And one major component of this is trying to understand the contribution of groundwater to stream flow. So groundwater's impacts is pretty hard um, to measure for a number of reasons. The first is that you can't really directly measure groundwater, right? It's under the subsurface. You, there's no way to easily access it. Uh, wells are point sources on a landscape, and they're really expensive to drill. There's time lags between water withdrawals and potential impacts, impacts to stream flow. Individual basins can have like mixed lithologies and that complicates the subsurface dynamics within those basins. And headwater catchments are pretty different from lowland systems where a lot of hydraulic models were developed. And those models are now being applied in headwaters where they might not be as relevant. So groundwater is also important because it drives most of the stream flow in coastal California. This is a hydrograph from the South Fork of the Eel River uh, for multiple years. Each of these peaks correspond to discharge associated with a precipitation event during our winter rainfall season. And then during the summer drawdown period, stream flow is entirely driven by the hill slopes draining groundwater, which creates discharge during that time. And if you think about kind of California, all of these blue points on this map are uh, drainages that have that type of hydrograph. They're fed by rainfall and then uh, groundwater during the summer season. And it's also relevant because we know um, by work from Chris and others that a lot of cultivators are using wells to irrigate their crops, specifically in arid areas like southern Mendocino County, where you can see these dark numbers correspond to up to 80 percent, 80 to 100 percent of farms are using wells as their primary irrigation source. So where do these storage discharge sensitivity functions come in? So here I've kind of have two illustrative hill slope cross sections that represent two different time points. The first time point is on the top hill slope here, and you can see that there's a lot of that dark blue saturated zone water that is driving discharge. And if we go to time step two here, uh, you can see that that water table has receded naturally from evapotranspiration and discharge draining the hill slope. But you can think about the impact of pumping water from that groundwater table, uh, where that dash blue, blue line might represent the water table if pumping hadn't happened, and the, the solid line shows where pumping does happen. And the storage discharge sensitivity functions are represented by the curve in the middle there. You, they relate stream discharge with landscape level storage with the sensitivity function G of Q, and that's a clever way to kind of relate measurable stream discharge to groundwater storage in the landscape and kind of go back and forth between those two things and make predictions about how the hydrograph will proceed over a given period of time. And this is kind of a, a, a clever mathematical way that circumvents a lot of those hydraulic problems in other uh, situations. And these were developed by James Kirshner and have been widely applied by my colleague, David Drolly in other situations. So our study design was to really create a number of hypothetical situations that represent different parameters um, that vary in cannabis agriculture on the landscape. So we're using these storage discharge relationships to make synthetic hydrographs um, that varies water source, whether farms were pumping water out of groundwater or using surface water diversions. Farm water use efficiency, we see a wide range of farm water use area normalized efficiency. Um, and so we wanted to represent some of that variation, the area of cannabis on the landscape, different lithologies, and then uh, you know California has an extremely variable climate and we wanted to encompass some of that variability as well. I'll go through each of those parameters just like super briefly. Um, farm water use efficiency, this is modeled by Chris Dillis et al. And uh, you see a, a large range in farm water use. Each of these box plots are shown for months of the year, including the cannabis cultivation season. If we expand one of those months, like August, where you see the highest modeled water use, you see a distribution of all of these farms on the landscape. Uh, and what we did was we picked the 50th, 75th, 90th, and 95th percentile represented by those little blue dots at the bottom of that histogram there. 
Aerial coverage of cannabis obviously varies across the state of California drastically. Um, we looked in Mendocino and Humboldt County in particular, and we picked five different levels, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 1, 2.5, and 4.5% cannabis agriculture by area on the landscape. And really, 1, 2.5, and 4.5 are very high values. They might not seem very high, but the, those are really high values of aerial coverage of uh, cannabis. But just keep that in mind as we're going through some of the results. For lithologies, we have this, uh, we were lucky to work in two streams that have very been very well studied hydraulically, and these are Elder Creek and Dry Creek. Both are in the greater Eel River drainage, and they're about 15 kilometers apart, so they share a climate, but they're separated by this lithological contact zone here. Elder Creek is in the coastal belt. Dry Creek is a little bit more eastern and in this melange, and that leads to different watershed characteristics. I'll, I'll describe those super briefly here. Um, on the right of these hill slope cross sections, you have Elder Creek, which has a relatively thick weathering profile of its soils, and that leads to high landscape level storage capacity of that landscape. And that means that Elder Creek is a perennial stream. It has persistent summer flow. You have mixed conifer forests, so there's vegetation differences in these two drainages. If you compare that to the left, uh, these images here, you have Dry Creek, which has a relatively thin weathering profile that leads to a very flashy stream, um, and it's kind of like grassland, oak savanna type habitat. Okay, so those are our kind of the different parameters that we involved, and we combined all of those parameters pairwise to create synthetic uh, situations, and that resulted in like 336 hydrographs that I'll kind of summarize briefly. I'll pick out a couple to talk about these results. Um, okay, so these are hydrographs. This is kind of the results of these storage discharge sensitivity functions. These are hydrographs that are synthetic for both Elder Creek on the left and Dry Creek on the right. Um, our different lines represent different scenarios. So the blue line is just measured discharge in both of our streams. The dashed orange line is our modeled hydrograph. So you can see that that tracks the blue line pretty well, which we were excited about. Uh, that means our model performance is pretty good. The green line represents an impaired hydrograph that's entirely due to cannabis farms pumping water from the groundwater table. And then the red line represents direct surface water withdrawals by farms to irrigate their crops. So in these scenarios, this water year is representative of like 2017, a median water use rate and 2.5% cannabis cover on the landscape. And you can see that Dry Creek, um, our melange stream goes dry every year just under natural conditions, but this level of water withdrawals greatly accelerates oops, greatly accelerates that drying. In Elder Creek, 2.5% cannabis cover on the landscape is enough to dewater this uh, historically perennial stream that's never been observed as intermittent during the summer season. And another interesting th thing to point out is that uh, the effects of surface water withdrawal are accelerated compared to groundwater withdrawal, which we might expect. If we decrease the percent cannabis cover on the landscape to 0.25%, so a tenth of the previous picture, uh, you can still see that in Dry Creek, there are pretty substantial impacts with accelerated drying. And in Elder Creek, there are impacts, but they're a little harder to see because they're proportionally less so. We can make other comparisons like uh, water use efficiency. So I'm comparing the median water user on the left here to the 95th percentile water user, a less efficient, less efficient use of water. Uh, and you can see that this is kind of a, a, to me, a little bit of a symbol for hope that if we can use irrigation practices that are a little bit more efficient, we can greatly reduce the environmental impacts. Uh, the lines are closer to, you know, the modeled use in this lower impact situation. We can aggregate these findings uh, to think about some uh, other response variables, like the total percent reduction in summer flow. So here, the dashed line represents surface water extraction, and the solid line represents groundwater extraction for both of our drainages. We've got percent aerial coverage of cannabis agriculture on the x-axis and percent reduction in summer flow on the y-axis. And you can see that in those really high coverage situations, there's really large reductions in summer flow from cannabis agriculture. But uh, more realistically, these are the values that you see more typically on the landscape. Um, and what's harder to see here is that Dry Creek actually responds more rapidly to any sort of extraction than Elder Creek does. 
meaning that it's more sensitive. This is that same data plotted in a slightly different way. So here I've plotted initial flow value on the x-axis, which is representative of water year. So values on the left of the x-axis would be like a very dry year. Waters on the right would be, or values on the right would be representative of a very wet year. On the x-axis, we've got an effective pumping rate, which is the area of cannabis times the extraction rate. Um, so warmer colors represent higher impacts relative to cooler colors. And what you can see, those warmer colors are kind of concentrated on the top left of these plots, showing that in very dry years with lots of pumping, um, you see high impacts. But I think what this plot emphasizes is that there's a, a large effect of water year type. In a very dry year, you might have a very big effect. And on a very wet year, you might see a relatively um, much less effect. So that's worth kind of taking into account as we try to regulate these systems. Um, we can look at other response variables like number of additional uh, zero flow days. And those trends kind of match the percent reduction in summer flow with the caveat that dry creek goes dry every year. So you see this kind of effect saturate rather quickly. Okay, so here are just some conclusions to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, the application of these storage discharge sensitivity functions might be particularly useful in these headwater catchments uh, where cannabis agriculture happens. They could be applied to all sorts of other agricultural products as well. Um, it, lower initial conditions, meaning drier years, higher coverage of cannabis, higher pumping rates, and extraction from surface water rather than wells all lead to lower summer discharge and more days of zero flow. Milan streams, that's our dry creek, was more sensitive to water withdrawals compared to Elder Creek, and that resulted in accelerated drying and uh, greater impacts from similar withdrawal rates. There's a, like I mentioned, there's a wide variation in cannabis uh, irrigation efficiency, so there's a lot of work that could be done to kind of optimize that, including on-site storage, which might decouple plant demand from extraction time of water from these water sources. And then pumping's effect is uh, expected to be delayed relative to surface water diversion. But I'll just say that, you know, this might seem like I'm kind of advocating for pumping rather than surface water diversions, but there still might be kind of like important impacts that we should consider uh, from groundwater extraction. Like there's other ecosystem level impacts like the plants that with rely on groundwater tables. Um, and this effect, this method really integrates effects over the water watershed level. And we know that farms are clustered on the landscape and the spatial distribution of those farms matters too. So um, this is a useful method when you're thinking about the watershed level, but there's also smaller scale uh, spatial impacts that are important. And with that, I'll acknowledge, you know, thank the UCNRS system, the CRC for all of these collaborations that it's been facilitated. It's been really great to be a part of this group. Uh, the Department of Cannabis Control, which funded this work, and the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory. And I'll take any questions. After this. <laughs> Thanks. So last but not least, we have the student researchers, Mia Puzo and Celeste Idal. Do you like speaker notes? Mm -hmm. No. Just this thing. You obviously see that. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, this we are um student researchers and we're part of Surge, which is an undergraduate research group, and we are representing our committee, which is investigating um the environmental and social impacts of in cannabis farming in Northern California. Um, so we split up our project into three sectors. There is a nature sector, a water sector, and an urban sector, which we, we will all be going over individually. Um, so first, I want to go over some foundational questions that we have. Um, overall, we're kind of just researching um, the environmental and social impacts seen in Northern California from cannabis cultivation. Um, the nature sector is more looking at how cannabis farming disrupts ecological processes and ecosystems and the native wildlife present in places with high cannabis cultivation. The water section is more focusing on how the differences between permitted and unpermitted farms and um, how they source water and utilize that water and the subsequent ecological impacts of that. And the urban sector is looking at how cannabis 
farming and production impacts urban communities as well as marginalized communities. Um, and for our club, we base our research on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So these are the goals that we focused on throughout um, the project. So initially, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of our peer who developed the nature sector. Her name is Isabella Orr, um, and she is just a freshman here at Berkeley. So um, she has been looking a lot at the ecological stress that has been applied by cannabis farms and um, specifically with a focus on wildlife. So to just kind of briefly go over like how she broke down her research, she looked at legal, industrial and illegal farm farming operations and any variation that existed within um, ecological impacts of the different operation types. So um, this typically took a framework of habitat uh, fragmentation and the corrosive impacts of um, contamination and um, overexploitation of resources on the landscape. So um, going a little bit deeper into what this sector looked at, um, variety of species that were disproportionately impacted by cannabis cultivation, uh, especially through different processes like habitat loss, um, diversion of water from streams, uh, chemical contamination, increasing mortality rates, and um, adaptive shifts in behavior um, due to these new living condition uh, changes. So what this sector was looking at um, was how and a fragment uh, habitat fragmentation led to limitation of resources um, to help survival for species and how it actually decreased that adaptive cap capability of a lot of species. Um, she also looked at water diversion and how this tends to uh, upset the life cycles of a lot of fish and species that depend on specific, very specific flow regimes and at the, um, how it interferes with the dissolved oxy oxygen content for streams and um, uh, how it decreases the productivity of food webs. And in addition, how agricultural pr um, production pr um, generates a lot of rodenticides and uh, chemicals that uh, interfere with and threaten bodily functions and have uh, capacity for bioaccumulation. Um, and then this is just a graph she wanted to include um, as a brief example of incursion of cannabis uh, cultivation on uh, habitats of three different endangered species among the Emerald Triangle. Um, and then so for my own particular research interests in the water sector, I've been uh, curious about the utilization patterns and practices and how they vary across the different um, of farming operation types. I've been looking at any information I can find in terms of legislation, um, spatial information and knowledge and uh, the physical hydrology of surrounding these farming operations. And just wanna briefly mention that this work was also contributed to by um, Bella Najad, who was a part of our team last semester. Um, so in order to first understand the dynamics of water use among the cannabis industry, um, I wanted, well, we wanted to contextualize ourselves with the system of um, like California's water system and how it's allocated. And so this started with looking at the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and how that gets, how that dictates water usage through um, more municipal agencies and also looking at the suite of water uh, rights and how they, those dictate acquisition of water resources on a more permanent basis. And so when I first started looking into this project, I was really interested on how water rights impact farmers in particular, how those might be used as justification for different extraction levels and how um, the acquisition of these rights and um, usage might differ across uh, operation types. And I sort of realized as I went through the project that um, maybe water rights isn't always a perfect uh, predictor of how these operations use different uh, use their water differently, especially because a lot of these growers move to these areas and to grow cannabis and don't really want to go through that process of acquiring water, right? And 
so um, instead, um, I started to look at how to distinguish outdoor operations from more mixed light operations. And of course, mixed light operations, as we've seen, tend to have denser concentrations of plants and uh, that leads to them extracting outside the growing season and um, creating more of a demand on local water sources. And then as we has been a common topic among uh, the CRC and something that I'm interested in is illegal versus legal farms um, and the data gap that exists there between private and public lands. And um, because of course, illegal operations are able to extract more outside of the growing season and from more of the sources because they go without regulation. And of course, this creates an environmental stress that um, could be offset if more farms had access to um, ponds to draw from but of course that's not something we can control so i've been uh as i take my research forward i'm curious to look at how um there might be any regulatory or program support for farmers to implement uh, water storage on their uh, properties especially because this becomes a question of expenses and topography and um isolation among these farms so that is the direction that I'm going to be taking next and as well I'm interested in how a lot of these farming operations are going to be contending with uh, warming temperatures and fluctuating flow regimes throughout Northern California. Um, so the urban sector is kind of split into two sections. Um, there's a more broad urban category about how Cannabis cultivation interacts with urban life, mainly in cities and dense urban areas. And the other one is a case study about how the cannabis market interacts with Native American communities and um, tribes in Northern California. Um, so as a brief overview of what we've discovered, um, the impacts of cannabis are in these urban environments. Um, there's a lot of risk for the people involved in the industry, either those working in cannabis facilities, cannabis facilities being indoor growing operations or cannabis processing facilities. Um, many of these cannabis processing facilities use highly volatile chemicals and solvents that are extremely dangerous to work with. Um, and there is also a lot of safety issues that are found throughout these cannabis facilities due to lack of regulations and federal protections because of the federal illegality of cannabis. Um, and there's also a large amount of displacement happening in order to create these cannabis facilities. Um, and sadly, a lot of people that are displaced are often a part of marginalized communities. And when cannabis um, facilities are concentrated, they are able to create diesel death zones, which are really toxic and un, basically uninhabitable conditions that many people are sadly subject, subjected to. Um, and then on the environmental sides, basically cannabis facilities require a large amount of energy and light in order to sustain um, the plants they are growing. So that could be heating, ventilation, AC, um, overall light usage. Um, and that is obviously extremely demanding for the urban env environment that it's in and also creates a bunch of light pollution that is also damaging to the local community. Um, and to get into our case study about Native American communities and their land and how it interacts with cannabis cultivation, I first started to look at um, the policies kind of surrounding tribal land and tribal cannabis cultivation. Um, and the main law that I found super interesting, which is up on that figure down there, is public law 280, um, which requires mandatory states, which California is one of, um, to assume criminal jurisdiction over tribal lands. Um, and that is a direct violation of tribal sovereignty, but it creates a lot of barriers of en to entry that many tribes face when trying to get into the cannabis market. Um, so it's an explanation for a lot of the injustices we find we I've found throughout further research. Um, so Cannabis cultivation is extremely an extremely lucrative opportunity for tribes because of the tax exemptions that they face due to not being considered a state nor a territory of, territory of the United States. Um, so they have way increased profit margins compared compared to their competitors. But many tribes are actually not with it, not utilizing this economic opportunity, and it's because they, a lot of them are hesitant to enter the cannabis market. And this is because they are not protected by state and territorial 
business laws that um, other cannabis um, sellers are protected by due to them being a domestic sovereign nation, um, which is essentially another excuse by the federal government to not protect tribes. Um, and there's also been a history of federal raids of tribal grown cannabis completely within regulations. So I think that scares off a lot of prospective tribes looking to enter the cannabis market. Um, an example of one of those federal raids that's very well documented is the Pitt River Tribe. Um, the Pitt River Tribe was running a completely legal medical marijuana program in Northern California. Um, and they were raided by the federal government in which their plants were seized, confidential patient information was seized, and many members of the tribe faced abuse from the raid. Um, and when they followed up and they asked for the reason they were raided, um, the U.S. Attorney Office refused to answer, basically being like, we just raided you because we could. And um, that is sadly what happens for a lot of these tribes, which makes it not accessible for tribes to enter the cannabis market. Um, but there is also the problem of unpermitted or illegal grows that target Native American land. Um, reservations are a prime target for unpermitted cannabis cultivation due to prime growing conditions and um, lack of monitoring um, because tribal police, tr tribal law enforcement is often severely underfunded and the federal government does little to monitor um, reservation spaces. Um, and illegal grows have extremely destructive impacts on the ecosystems they're in. They divert large amounts of water. Um, there's fertilizer runoff that's extremely toxic to um, the fish in rivers nearby. Um, and there's often rivers nearby because they often target ancestral locations that have rivers. Um, and those are often found in Native American lands who have built communities around rivers that they rely on. And there is fertilizer runoff into these rivers that Native American people rely on for fish and sustenance. And there's actually been a couple of cases of Native fishers, fishermen being killed by consuming um, toxic fish. Um, and pesticides also kill a lot of nearby wildlife. Um, and then there is obviously wildlife that consumes that toxic wildlife. And there's a chain of destruction and mortality that um, we see from these illegal cannabis farms. And there is also a large amount of hazardous waste that is also extremely toxic to the wildlife. Um, and certain tribes have made efforts to eradicate the illegal grows on their land. Um, and an example of this is Operation Yurok. The Yurok tribe um, had been has been the target of countless legal grows, um, and they saw that a lot of their water was being diverted. They didn't have enough water for their community to be, be sustained. Their cultural activities were being disrupted, and um, the salmon that they relied on were being killed in significant numbers. So they decided to team up with the federal government um, in what was dubbed Operation Yurok, and they eradicated tens of thousands of marijuana plants on their land. Um, and you can see down there how destructive these gro illegal grows can be because they're obviously unpermitted, not regulated at all. They leave behind a bunch of trash that is obviously extremely harmful to these ecosystems and communities nearby. Um, and just to go over what we're currently working on now, previously all the information was kind of a literature review we conducted first semester and now in the second semester, we're more focusing on conducting interviews, talking to professionals, building our knowledge base and further expanding our research. And then we're also hoping to, we're planning, we're actively compiling a story map, um, which will include multiple maps spanning all the sectors um, to just compile the information in a presentable way and also have a visual demonstration of what we've been working on. Um, and that is our presentation. Thank you so much.